Good evening. Um, I should preface what I'm, I actually asked to go first, because as the non-artist or artist historian on the panel, um, I think my presentation will be less provocative, and maybe we'll just establish some foundation for engaging Walker's work for people uh, that have not encountered it before. Um, I am a historian by training, but I work in the discipline of black studies, and I should say, as I approach Walker's work, I came at it primarily to begin with as someone who was interested in art as a hobby. You know, as someone that's been curious about art of all traditions. But also for me, Walker's work is completely, uh, you know, compelling in the sense that it's part of a black studies tradition, uh, which is the discipline that I'm a part of and that I work with here at the University of Wyoming African American and Diaspora Studies program. So Carol Walker is an African American artist born in Stockton, California in 1969, but who moved to the small town of Stone Mountain, Georgia at the age of just 13. Stone Mountain is perhaps best known for the natural landmark from which it derives its name, and that is now the site of the largest high-relief sculpture in the world, and that sculpture is a Confederate memorial covering more than one and a half acres and depicting three prominent Civil War Confederates, General Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, and Confederate President Jefferson Davis. The monument was conceived in 1915 by Caroline Helen Jemison Plain, a leading member of the Atlanta chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Plain viewed the monument as a way to honor Southern veterans and memorialize the so-called lost cause of the Confederacy. This mythology of the lost cause conjured a vision of the Confederate South as a noble and virtuous society, despite its defeat at the hands of Union forces. However, representing antebellum life as noble and virtuous necessitated that proponents of the lost cause minimize the role of slavery in the Civil War, pointing to sectional conflicts rooted in states' rights, continues to be an argument that's made today, a false argument, and also offered a romanticized narrative of antebellum southern plantation life and slavery itself. As historian Roland Osterweiss surmises, it was a landscape dotted with figures drawn mainly out of the past. The chivalric planter, the magnolia-scented southern belle, the good gray Confederate veteran, and the obliging old Uncle Remus. Joining these stock figures were a host of other racial stereotypes, or as black feminist scholar Patricia Hill Collins defines them, controlling images. African American women were represented as either the faithful subservient mammy, who places the interests and needs of the white planter family before that of her own, or the sexually aggressive Jezebel, who through her seemingly natural promiscuity deflects allegations of rape at the hands of slave owners, central to the plantation economy. Both types, Mammy and Jezebel, served as powerful historical fictions that reflected less of reality than of the desires and anxieties of white Americans. Indeed, these controlling images, as Collins calls them, were carefully designed to justify the enslavement of African Americans in the recent past, as well as their continued subordination to white supremacy in the present. In the decades following the Civil War, this lost cause mythology was promoted by politicians, scholars, civic organizations, writers, and artists, becoming a central trope not only in the South, but in broader American popular culture. In 1915, when the Daughters of the Confederacy were busy marshalling support for the creation of the Stone Mountain Monument, the lost cause mythology reached its national apex with the release of D.W. Griffith's epic film, Birth of a Nation, which glorified the Klu, Klu Klux Klan's reign of terror across the post-emancipation South. Inspired by Griffith's portrayal, a group of white Southerners, including two former Klansmen, met at Stone Mountain later that year to form the new Klu Klux Klan, an organization that will play a leading role in the epidemic of racial violence against African Americans that struck the nation during the period we refer to in African American history as the nadir, or the low point of African American history. Much of Carol Walker's childhood was spent in the shadow of this particular cultural landscape. Its racially charged stock types and narrative devices reverberated through the society in which she was raised, perpetuated by cultural adaptations such as the minstrel show, civil war reenactments that take place regularly to this day at Stone Mountain, the historical romance novel, and motion pictures like Gone with the Wind. 
Walker has stated that her middle class parents sought to protect her from these controlling images, a task that proved difficult in Stone Mountain, where such narratives were ever present and powerfully shaped perceptions of the past and present, black and white. As Gwendolyn Du Bois Shaw describes, and I want to represent her book here because it's absolutely fantastic, it's the best work I've seen done on uh, Kara Walker. Walker began seeing her racial identity, according to Shaw, as something that was lived and performed on a daily basis in some sort of pageant in which she was a unwilling participant. Upon leaving the South and enrolling in the Rhode Island School of Design, Walker began to critically engage these racially charged aesthetic traditions from what I would argue is a postmodern black feminist or womanist perspective. In much of the work you will view today and you have been viewing in your walkthrough, Walker draws upon modes and mediums of representation evocative of the historical epoch of enslavement and emancipation. In terms of mediums, the silhouette features most prominently and harkens back to the pseudo-scientific work of 18th century Swiss minister Johann Caspar Lavater. Lavater was a pioneer of the now discredited field of physiognomy, which claimed a correspondence between facial features, moral character, and intelligence. In his 1794 text, Essays on Physiognomy, Lavater provides a range of profiles in silhouette, asserting that nations have their own unique physiognomical features that in turn reflect deeper differences in national character. Of course, for Lavater, difference also has a value, and European physiognomical features were deemed, in his words, less animalistic, and thus more human than those of their non-European counterparts. The field of physiognomy was also embraced across the Atlantic, where it bolstered the belief in white supremacy and slaveholder aristocracy. Inspired by Lavater's work, American artist and slaveholder Charles Wilson Peale patented the physiognotrace which I can't pronounce, so I tried, hopefully I passed, um, a device that would allow artists to produce silhouettes of their patrons. However, at Peel's Museum in Philadelphia, and this was interesting to me from Shaw's work, it was Moses Williams, a manumitted slave and artist, who was responsible for producing the thousands of silhouettes of white museum goers that are on record today. Williams also created one silhouette of himself. It's clear that Williams struggled, according to Shaw, with his own silhouette in the context of the larger ideological implications of his aesthetic choices, ultimately settling on uh, what Shaw refers to as a racially ambivalent depiction that emphasized anglicized features by distorting the original trace lines. This type of creative license was central to the production of silhouettes, which reflected reductions more than realities, desires more than truths. But it also reflects the tremendous power and psychological costs of this medium for African-American artists like Williams. And so at this point, I turn to Walker, who uses them too. For Kara Walker, the reductive quality of the silhouette its tendency toward the creation of stock types more than complex human realities makes it an ideal medium for the representation of the mythic lost cause narrative and its attendant racial stereotypes. In Walker's own words, silhouettes are reduction and racial stereotypes are also reductions, but of actual human beings. Using the silhouette as a medium allows Walker to demonstrate the flatness, unrealness, and grotesque nature of both the Lost Cause narrative and its cast of characters, at the same time as illustrating their tremendous power and resonance for contemporary viewers like us. In her play on Harper's pictorial um, history of the Civil War, which actually is all the way down this wall here, it's fantastic, Walker takes the magazine's iconic but Eurocentric 19th century portrayals of the sectional conflict and overlays them with the black figures that are notably absent from the picture, a subtle jab at Harper's editorial board who claimed they had, quote, narrated events just as they occurred. However, the representations are not of actual freed men and women but rather those persistent stock types that continue to circulate and recirculate in new and adapted forms. What does it mean, Walker seems to ask, that we believe we know the race of these subjects by a simple silhouette? And what does our assumed knowledge of their racial identity tell us about their moral character and intelligence? 
What do we project as viewers onto these black cutouts of paper? And where do we obtain those meanings? In this sense, Walker's use of silhouettes exposes our complicity in an aesthetic tradition that continues to shape notions of identity and value through a, de through a dehumanizing process of othering and objectification. This play on stereotypical representations has been a common theme among African-American artists since the Black Power era. In the work of artists like Michael Ray Charles, imaged here, Carrie Mae Weems, here, and Renee Cox, here. Well-worn types are often reappropriated, exaggerated, and parodied as a means to undercut their ideological power. Interviews with Carol Walker indicate that she envisions herself within this tradition, taking control of the dominant mediums and modes of racial representation and manipulating them to her own ends. We certainly see this in images like this, which is scene number seven of the Emancipation Approximation, which is, I believe, in the room just behind there. Uh, which Gwendolyn Du Bois Shaw has persuasively interpreted as a deconstruction of the mammy stereotype. As Du Bois Shaw argues, Walker's women do not focus their attention outward, seeking the satisfaction of white others, but towards each other instead. In examples like this, black women, even those consigned to enslavement, are depicted with agency and, like Walker, use it for their own purposes and desires, ceasing to be stereotypes and becoming something more in the process. However, some African-American artists have argued that Walker's work does more to reinforce racial stereotypes than topple them and in the process played into the desire of white curators for comfortable stock representations. While I would question whether these images are comfortable for any of us as viewers, it's important to note that Walker's work is not vindicationist or didactic in nature. And I want to close on a discussion of that point. Um, as Harper's Weekly images that we just looked at showed and the ones on this wall here, Walker is not seeking to simply replace negative images with positive ones. Rather, the message of her work is often deeply ambiguous and thus hard for us to interpret. When we, uh, what are we to uh, make of this image, for example, uh, which is also in the next room, of scene number six in Walker's The Emancipation Prox Approximation, in which the sexual abuse of black women by slaveholders, depicted in a silhouette bearing remarkable likeness to George Washington, is represented front and center, so that's one part of this story. Yet on closer reflection, we see that the slaveholder is held up by an enslaved man, and the woman's image is mediated through the trope of the Jezebel, which troublingly casts her as a pliant and willing participant. Is Walker mocking these sentimentalized portrayals? Is she perhaps commenting on how black women's historical suffering has been and is still used as a source of titillation in our culture? Or perhaps as Shaw has provocatively argued, is Walker encouraging all viewers to wrestle with what she calls the unspeakable and traumatic possibility, and this is her words, that their ancestors may at times have been complicit in the violent culture that they were forced to live in? A troubling question. As historian Roderick Ferguson argues, Walker's work takes up, in his words, black feminism's historic effort of compelling people to brave the unspeakable and look bold-faced at those elements to which African-American history has so often turned its back, whether that be rape, same-sex love, infanticide, incest, Whatever we conclude in these debates after viewing Walker's work for ourselves, it's clear that she has left us a lot to discuss in our classes this semester and for a long time to come. Thank you.